Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. It's great to be with you. I'm Hondo Carpenter from Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation, and you know I'm your Raiders beat writer. This guy right here, Johnny Guitars, is is a ter- terrific participant and 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 really um, not only a participant, he is a huge part of everything that we do on our coverage. We love having Johnny on. Johnny's a, a great journalist. He is very respected journalist. He's a respected attorney. So where I cover the Raiders microly, he looks back at the Raiders macroly in a perspective. So today we've got a lot to talk about with Telesco, Antonio, some other things. John, let's get right at it because AP made a comment in a sit-down session. Anybody didn't see the film needs to go back and watch it. We've got it. Um, that really hit you. Now, it hit me. It, when, when he first said it, I thought, yeah, and I thought like you thought. But I got emails from saying people saying, well, does that mean he's only going to pick black? And I'm like, you idiots. No offense, but if that's what you took when you saw it, I, I have to really sincerely question your intelligence because he had nothing to do with color. John, you address that real quick. Yeah, silver and black is what he's looking for, no doubt. Mm-hmm. So what he talked about there was he basically laid out that everybody they draft, he's going to see a little bit of himself in that player, whether it's uh, intensity, tenacity, football IQ, willingness to be coached, drive and desire, I think, are two things that stand out a lot. But he kind of laid out a roadmap for what him and Tom Telesco are going to do. So as we look at who the Raiders draft this year in the years to come, each player, it sounds like, is going to have some identity DNA matching with the head coach. I would suggest that's probably a really good idea. Too often we have seen misfit draft picks, oftentimes from the owner or some other wild card person, that don't work out. On a rare occasion, they do. Usually they don't, but what AP- We're just talking about the NFL in general. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Just the NFL in general. And we'll probably see it this year. You don't see the better franchises do it. You don't see the the franchises that really never have a super low and they often have a chance at a really high. Um, This is a good thing to have your coach. He's got nothing to hide. He's basically telling you who he is and what they're gonna do. He's saying, listen, there's things that we want out of players. We're going to draft him. And when you draft him, expect to see, expect me to think that I see some of me inside of each of those kids. That's something to keep in mind the entire line of the draft as this brand new era really does shift. And you've got two guys piloting it that sound like so far they're working on the same page. Yeah, John, to me, what stood out was he's basically saying, I want people with my grit. I want people that play the game because they love it. Now, that takes me into our next segment. Judd Heathcote, the great Michigan State coach, a dear friend of mine, a guy I know that you really admired, the, he won a national championship with Irvin, uh, when the, obviously when he beat Larry Bird. He one day brings in Eric Snow to his office. He's a basketball coach, but says to Eric, I'm switching you to point guard. But, Coach, I ain't a point guard. I want to play in the league. He's like, yep. But all you need is one team to fall in love with you. We know Eric had a tremendous career in the NBA. NIL has changed college football, in my opinion, in yours. And I'm I'm not blaming the players, by the way. NIL has changed the game of college football. They're ruining the game. And coaches now are jumping off the college ranks. I had so many coaches and executives in the NFL. To, one executive told me I got over a hundred college coaches that reached out to me because we had a lot of uh, openings. Get me out of college. I don't care what the cost is. I want out. I don't want to do this anymore. He goes, I go, what's the usually he goes eh, five to 10. Get over a hundred, John over a hundred. And so my comment to you is this, and I think it's very simple. I had one guy tell me, you know, all of a sudden now you'd go, people used to go to the combine who were hungry. Hey, I want to get to the league. I want to provide for my family. Now they're walking in. I got five mil in my pocket. Tell me why I should grace you with my presence and play in the league. I and mean, you got Caleb Williams' people talking about he wants a percentage of the team. That is so absurd and stupid. 
It is so absurd. It is such an absurd and stupid comment that you would think the agent or somebody would go to them and say, shut up. Uh, John, you've been with me a long time. You know who my sources are. They're rock solid. And the people that I know who are from the good teams that are successful quarterback pickers who aren't consistently in the top half of the draft all said to me, Caleb hurt himself. Now He's still going to get picked one or two because people are going to look at the talent. He goes, but one guy told me we didn't have him graded as a first rounder. Now we don't even want him. Just NIL. And, you know, he made allegedly 15 million. That's what's no, I'm told it was probably higher than that. How is it? We know what NIL is doing to college football. And again, don't blame the players. I think they should get paid and should make every dime that they get. So I'm not blaming them. But NIL, what it's doing to college is now hurting the pros. And some coaches are even telling me, I'm looking for guys that didn't have the big NILs. Your thoughts, John Shaw. You've talked about when I was in the financial services industry, there, there was a, a famous guy, uh, Mario Gabelli, who talked about looking for people with PhD. They're poor, hungry, and desperate. So there's a lot of that that you're looking for from the NFL level. You want guys that are driven. And what we've got now is some of the the pool, some of the college pool is kind of been poisoned. They've been poisoned by who knows what kind of team structure they were in, but they've been poisoned by cold, hard cash. Whether they know how to handle it, what to do with it, that stuff's out the window. How much they got or didn't get, we don't really know. If somebody got a lot, at some point in time, there's going to be a tax crisis coming into the NFL that teams probably won't know about, and they're going to find out about, and that's a whole other distraction to deal with. So what you've got is the pool of players that supply the NFL, and some of them are coming in with a little bit of poison to them. Not that money's bad, but money does change people. It has changed people, and it will change people forever. And in the case of anyone at the top of this draft, and at the top coming drafts until that NIL and college football is either reorganized or somehow organized, disciplined, kind of like you'd run any good business, it's something the NFL has to watch out for. Because as I have said for almost all of our years, and I will say for the rest of my years, complacency kills the cat way more than curiosity. If you've got a franchise quarterback you're looking to stock your team with, and he's complacent or already kind of cooled it or feels like he's already made it, that's not somebody that's going to be optimizing their NFL career. That may not be somebody that you can depend on, that you can count on. We've seen bad examples too many of them from guys kind of flushing a good chunk of their career away like Michael Vick did in Atlanta to, um, you know, I mean, you go back as long as you, as, as you can think of where you see guys get the big fat contract and maybe just kind of cool it. Uh, the Lions roster was stuffed with that where complacency was like, okay, for a long time. Caleb Williams is a concern. I don't know who's talking around him, but I think they need to stop talking right now because they sound too much like Robert Griffin III did before he was basically pushed out of the NFL for good. That's the last guy you want to sound like. This is a brand. I understand that. Everybody's a brand now. If you're going to be a brand, you got to be really careful. I am, I am concerned about Caleb Williams' approach around the combine and, and the stories and the news that came out. I'm also concerned that he didn't pop up and say, that's dead wrong. This is not me, et cetera, for some of the stuff that came out. It's not just picking on Caleb Williams. It's a way bigger issue than just him. But every team that's drafting has now a new element to consider. They have to consider the mentality, the motivation level, the complacency level of anybody that they're drafting, at least in the premium rounds, let alone at the very top in the most position, obviously the most important position in sports. I was having lunch at the Westin with a GM. And by the way, the best pork belly I've ever had in my life. John, you and I got to go to Indianapolis again just for the pork belly. Oh, my God. It was so good. Thank God for pigs. <laughs> Anyways, um, and he said to me, he, he's told me before, but he reminded me, he goes, remember the Chinese proverb, very few people can handle failure. 
an even smaller measure can handle success. That to me was very telling. I thought he had a lot to say about Caleb and a lot to say just about the whole draft class in general. All right. Here, I want to me, turn to Tom Telesco. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you have something else you want to add? Yeah, I got something to add. You can see it in the individual sports, the, the concern. What you can sometimes see is a golfer that all of a sudden is flush with cash or has won uh, a major and you kind of see natural complacency and natural falling off of keeping that edge sharp. Some guys are playing for business first. That is an inherent concern with the NFL. They do a pretty good job of keeping it at bay, but that's always the concern is are you playing for business first? Or are you playing for passion and legacy first? The Raiders are looking for guys that want to be playing with passion for a legacy. The concern at the top of the draft is are you playing just for your business interest? If you are, are you ever going to get 100% of whatever player X, Y, or Z that you take? No. So most teams, if they're smart, are going to want to avoid more of those guys than they take a chance on. Very good point, John. All right, Telesco, let's get to him because a couple of things he said really stood out with you. Let's start first about the offensive line. And I thought the same exact thing. As soon as he said it, I thought, oh, that's a big deal. Your thoughts, John? Well, what he said was essentially laid out the magic number of seven. He basically said that you need at least seven on the roster, at least seven that can play. And you kind of you kind of go from there. So that really stuck into my mind that while they've got to have a starting five, they are really looking at seven as kind of the starting point. So when you think about roster and you think about filling the 53, absolutely, the Raiders are going to have, we know we're going to have seven at least. And then how many more can you tack on from there? And then how many more can you keep on a practice squad? It's just interesting to hear because sometimes you hear teams talk about, you know, just going with the five and there's some difference at the college level and the pro level, obviously, because the rosters are way different. But to hear an NFL GM who's starting from scratch with, it's not that his back's up against the wall, but this very unlikely that you would get a third GM go as a GM of an NFL team. He laid out for you right there seven we got to have seven and obviously they know they need more and they're going to do more in the off season and in the draft but it was interesting to hear somebody just lay that out there so anybody's thinking we only need six or maybe we need eight the raiders have basically just told you seven is the starting point and that, that is an interesting note to keep in the back of your mind yeah i thought the same thing john and then he really started talking about free agency and that that really pricked your attention would you talk about that please well, it took me by surprise a little bit because he said, look, we want to be signing our guys as free agents. And he really said something that is shocking a little bit to probably most of us that watch this sport so closely. He really said that a lot of the free agency success rate is not that high. So guys that you get from other teams as free agents, they don't necessarily have success and play better or play as good as they did before. That surprised me because when we think of free agency, as a blanket statement, a big statement, you think, oh, we're going to get so much better when we go get that guy. He's going to be our third baseman. He's going to be our free safety. He's going to be our wide receiver. He's going to change the offense. And an NFL GM, Tom Telesco, is telling you, if you actually study it, the success rate of free agents is not that high. So as a default setting, the Raiders are starting out with the intention of that they're going to keep more of their guys because that's going to actually lead to more success. That surprised me because I guess I'm a little bit of a sucker, like so many people who look at the free agent market and they're like, oh man, if we can get that guy or we can get that guy, we can get that guy, we're going to the next level. In reality, it sounds like if you study the broad success rate of free agency in the NFL, it doesn't work that way. So it's a little bit counterintuitive and certainly counter marketing as this free agency season gets ready and going. You got teams around the whole sport thinking, well, what if we... You know, you got five or six teams thinking, hey, what if we got Kirk Cousins? Or what if we get this guy to play wide receiver? Turns out the success rate isn't that high. This is interesting insight that I think you only get at this time of year. You only get at the combine. This is not stuff that they're going to want to go into or, or, or be thinking about when they're in the tunnel that is the actual season. So this is interesting stuff. Added bonus for those that look, listen, and study all the content that came out of this network from that combine. Lastly, Tom talked a lot at podium, off podium. You saw him in the original press conference. John, you've covered this league macroly. Um, by the way, I saw your favorite GM that you 
run into a lot down yeah. there, by the way. I want to just say that. And, uh, you know, you know some guys in this league, a lot of guys in this league. So my question for you is, what's your early impressions of Telesco? It looks to me like he's got a plan. And some of the um, some of the natural progression of getting into a new job, having never been a GM before, there's got to be a couple things that hit you different um, when you're the guy. And maybe he's in a tough spot. Every spot's different with salary cap and ownership. So it strikes me as actually a guy, it strikes me as a little more ready than somebody that was running on a treadmill, off the treadmill, gets right back on and is running. It seems like he's had some time to collect, process, store the knowledge and experience he had from the Chargers and now take it to this new situation and the new opportunity in Las Vegas. It strikes me that he is probably more thought out and has a plan um, that may be a little bit different than what he had with the Chargers. It's going to take some time to find out. But I don't have any impression that he's not really sure what he wants to do or how to get there. Now the question is, can they get there? And really, that's that ideally is a prerequisite for that job. But we've sometimes seen people struggle or we've seen people going down the hill and their collar gets grabbed by the owner this way or something else throws it off that way with the player doing something wild and crazy. So I like what I see as far as hearing Telesco, hearing Antonio Pierce separately talking about some of the same stuff. It sounds like so far there's a, a real working cohesion there, and that is only going to produce a better roster and better result. Yeah, the NFL Competition Committee is back to being the NFL Competition Committee, and they are about on the verge of making a mistake. Talk about it. What's, what's on? Well, the funneling through the end zone thing we saw show up last year. And we talked about the competition committee before the season. We talked about them during the season. We're going to talk about them now because whether it's the the push rule that they're not going to address or this fumbling through the end zone thing, this stuff seems to me like it's happening too fast. It doesn't seem to me like it's happening with enough maybe broader analysis. And again, I think they need a person or two that's on the competition committee. That's their only job. How many of these guys and gals could see all the games every week or even see all the plays that we're talking about that have caused these controversies? I'm not sure. I don't think it's a big ask for the NFL competition committee to suggest some improvements relative to the fumbling through the end zone rule. I really don't. It seems to be really stiff on the penalty side if somebody fumbles through the end zone. And I'm right there with you, folks. Well, don't fumble through the end zone. Of course not. But I like the idea that the rules of the game be set up in a way to encourage the best opportunity to identify the better team that day. And that's one where I think they probably are making a mistake there. Uh, the push rule, I don't necessarily mind. I don't have well, a problem. I'm, I'm with glad it. that they're – don't mess with it. Yeah, To and me, and we and don't – change... go ahead. No. And again, I want to see more teams using it on first and second down just to mix it up a bit. Um, there's an opportunity to change it as far as limiting the amount of guys that push, but you know, we don't have a problem with that. Um, we also don't have a problem with it. looks like they're sneaking a little bit of technology testing in there with the, with the first down. Uh, with the you sticks. like that. Absolutely, yeah. Let's get some chips and line it all up so we can kind of take some of the inaccuracy out of the game. It's a huge business. Obviously, it's the most popular form of entertainment in the country. It's also a massive, giant gambling, massive gambling uh, efforts. For small dollars, anywhere from somebody pressing one and two all the way up to big ones, but everybody interested in it is going to, by far and large, they're going to support the idea of give me the exact 10 yards, make it a little easier, make it a little quicker. Well, you cut out some time in the games. Maybe you could sell another commercial or two in there. So some of that stuff is is good, but it seems to me a little quick. How this stuff is all just getting blown over that quick. Like we don't need to address the the fumbling through the end zone rule. Well, are you sure? Because it seems like it does need to be addressed. See, I agree. That's the stupidity part I don't like. 
I love the technology and I love um, what they're doing with kickoffs potentially. I, I think that that is intriguing to me. So I think, the, but the fumbling for the end zone is ridiculous. All right, John, I want to get to one, one last thing with you. We, we, technology's coming. And we've been hammering it since before it was popular. Put another official up in the booth who has access to all the technology in the world. Let them review everything. Anything that's get, got wrong, let them fix it, change it, speed it up, get a couple millennials in there to her, show them how to use the technology, and go. I I love it. I think we're inching closer, Johnny Guitars. We are. And, you know, when we saw the somewhat hidden rules uh, with the officials, kind of the extra officials in some of the playoff games, it's like, huh, interesting. And an expansion of the sky eye or whatever you want to call it. We're looking for an off-field official that'll help administration and efficiency of the game. It's not that difficult to set it up in a way where he's got limited abilities, limited calls that can be made. For example, pushing a button because, you know, there's a massive personal foul away from the play that nobody saw. Looking at replays, looking at reviews. This is trending that way. And I understand maybe the NFL doesn't want to do too much at once. They don't want to take out the chains like we just talked about, they don't want to add an off-field official. They don't want to change, modify the kickoff rules. They don't want to do too much at once. I get that, but this is the one maybe of all that has stood out most. There was more criticism of NFL officiating in this past season than I remember for a good while. And I think a lot of it could have been remedied if they would have had an off-field official in place for each game. My contention all along has been that it was got to be the guys on the field that were pushing away from this. The officials not wanting this for decades. You shared with us earlier this year that that may not necessarily be the case. If that is the case, it seems to me the NFL is about 15 years behind here in getting this done. And the sport's going to get a lot better if they get there. But again, I circle back to a little bit of the concern that we heard out of the combine, which seemed to be that, that some of the stuff was already getting shut down by the competition committee. Now, maybe we just heard from one or two voices and that's not the story. I hope it's not. This is the time that the NFL should be looking at this stuff and, and making smart decisions and moving things forward. Um, so some hit and miss there, but I got to be a little bit reserved about accelerating the off-field official until they actually say this is what we're going to do and when they do we're going to pull those balloons and all that other stuff that came down uh on the screen for it all right johnny listen i greatly appreciate you some great information from you next time will you promise you'll start with a riff yeah i got one i got one in here absolutely all right john stand the line i want to talk to you real quick you guys are listening to the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. As you know, I am from SI Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation. Great to have you guys with us today. Follow me on Instagram at Hondo SR on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Hondo Carpenter. John, tell them your X handle. At JP Spartan. And JP Spartan. And then also SI.com forward slash NFL forward slash Raiders. Get all of our articles, upper right hand corner is where you can sign up for the newsletter. We will not spam you. We will not sell your information, but three days a week, we'll send you all of our best articles. Thanks for being with us today, everybody. God bless you.